As a speaker, it always makes me nervous when somebody who knows me is introducing me. Uh, I'm glad he read everything just like I wrote it and didn't tell the truth. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be here with you. And, and as we begin, I'd like to just say a few words about GBN. I appreciate uh, James talking about that. But as I begin talking about GBN, this congregation has been faithful supporters of the network for the past 13 years. And I wanted to begin by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for the support you've given the network and help us to do a lot of things. Uh, on the back table by the door in the foyer there, there's some DVDs. Please pick those up. There's some newsletters. Uh, there's a, some uh, blue sheets of paper there. Uh, if you're interested, please pick one of those up. Uh, detailing, I think, four of the conversions from the network just this year. Uh, kind of excited about that. So pick that up. Read some of the stories about some of the people whose lives have been changed. And you all here at Ripley have had a part in that work. Thank you so much for supporting us in, in this. Mentioned GBN is a, a television network 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we're on cable systems, uh, most of them here throughout the southeast. Uh, I wish I could say we had lots of uh, systems in Mississippi, but at this point, uh, we don't. Uh, we're working on that as well. We just earlier this year started up a uh, broadcast in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. Philadelphia sits right here, Atlantic City, New Jersey. It covers about 6.2 million people. And we just began broadcasting there in April. Very excited about that, an area of the country where the Lord's Church is really struggling. Uh, not many congregations and those that are there are pretty small. So we're, we're excited to be a part of that. Uh, if you have just about any type of device, a phone, a tablet, uh, a Roku, um, Apple TV, we have apps for all those devices. You can watch GBN programming uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, in 2018, using those methods, over a million hours of GBN programming was viewed. A million hours. We're getting the word out. So very thankful for that. If you have Dish Network, we have several programs available on Dish Network, also on DirecTV. And this information is available on the website gbntv.org if you're interested in that. We're also on YouTube. And if you notice here, 999,000 videos watched on YouTube. Uh, uh, so I'll just say, I'll encourage you, please go watch some YouTube. We want to get that up over a million in the next few weeks. And, and it, we will, but if we can get there before PTP, that would be wonderful. A million videos viewed. We're right there on the cusp. And tonight I'd like for us to spend a little time getting to know Jesus just a little bit better. Getting to know really who he is. Truly, he came as God in the flesh to this earth. Back in the, the mid-80s, there was a group that got together. They called themselves the Jesus Seminar. And they went about looking at Scripture and trying to determine what in Scripture was really true and what was just things that were made up. One of the conclusions this they're a bunch of crazy folks, honestly, that they came up with was this. They said, Jesus of Nazareth did not refer to himself as the Messiah, nor did he claim to be a divine being who descended to earth from heaven in order to die as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. A crazy statement. And, and those of us who are Christians would look at that and say, this is bizarre. But let me ask you this question. How would you prove them wrong? How would you go about proving that Jesus truly is the Christ, the Son of God? And what we're going to do is we're going to go take a journey quickly through Scripture, looking at the Old Testament, looking at the Gospel accounts, looking at the epistles, and seeing if indeed this is the case, or if Jesus did come as God in the flesh. And we're going to begin in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 7, verse 14, where Isaiah writes for us, Therefore the Lord himself will give us a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And this is a, a prophecy that 
universally is accepted to be talking about Jesus. But there's something you might miss here that Matthew in his gospel accounts brings out for us. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, then he tells us what Emmanuel means. It's a Hebrew word which is translated God with us. So we can go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and there's the prophecy, the virgin's going to conceive, bring forth a child, and it will be God with us. Very clearly stated. Later in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, another messianic prophecy. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we get to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and we see all these descriptive phrases for Jesus. Mighty God. That's who Jesus really was. And we have these prophecies and they continue. How about Micah chapter 5 verse 2? Another very messianic prophecy. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forths are from old, from everlasting. Again, clearly a messianic prophecy saying this particular Bethlehem, not the one up in Galilee, but this one here close to Jerusalem, that is where the Messiah is going to be born. And that baby who will be born there will bring forth a son who to be ruler in Israel, whose going forths are from old, from everlasting. You know, Jesus was just uh, explaining this a little bit further when he, he told those who asked him, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus acknowledging his deity, acknowledging his eternal existence from everlasting. Who is eternal? Who is everlasting but God himself? And, I, and Micah brings that out for us very nicely. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. The prophet says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. His prophecy about John the Baptist here, he's the messenger who's coming. Who's he preparing the way for? Me. It's God speaking. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. We see this clearly laid out that there's a messenger coming and he's going to precede God himself. He's going to precede the Lord who's going to come to the temple in Jerusalem. And as we look at these Old Testament prophecies, I'd like for us to realize that we have now in the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the 1940s on through about the 60s, different discoveries were made, copies of the Old Testament that were written before Jesus. So we know that these prophecies weren't something that people made up after Jesus was born, after he existed, trying to justify calling him the Son of God. Everything we've looked at was documented before he even came. So when you have people like those in the Jesus Seminar, those liberal theologians today who say, oh, well, Jesus, that, that was uh, him being the Son of God was something that was made up hundreds of years later. History says they are wrong. We have documents with all of this evidence dated older than Jesus. Let's continue on and see the New Testament. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. 
when Jesus with his, was with his disciples on those mighty rocks at Caesarea Philippi. Simon Peter answered, said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter very clearly and plainly laid forth the great confession of who Jesus is. And of course, when, G when Peter said that, Jesus said, whoa, Peter, you're going too far. No, he didn't. Jesus answered, said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven and I also say to you that you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. One thing I'd like for us to see from this passage in Matthew 16, this starts to explain why people are so quick to try to discredit Jesus, to try and, and some reason, strip away his divinity. Upon this fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. It's foundational to Christianity. If you take away the deity of Jesus, Christianity is empty. There's nothing there. That's why it continually gets attacked. And that's why we as children of God need to make sure we know how to defend this. And we are assured ourselves this is indeed the case. Jesus was worshipped. John chapter 9, when this blind man was healed, he came back to Jesus, said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. He worshipped Jesus. Back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, when Satan tempted Jesus and wanted him to bow down to him, he said, if you bow down to me, I will give you all these kingdoms. How did Jesus respond? He said, no, no, no. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. But John chapter 9, we have the blind man worshiping Jesus and Jesus accepting that worship. If Jesus accepted worship and only God could be worshiped, what does that make Jesus? Jesus. He is God. Revelation 22, verse 9. When John tried to bow down before an angel, the angel said, no, I don't want any part of that. For I am a, your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Yet Jesus accepted worship. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that Jesus lived his life without sin. So he could, if he was not God and he accepted worship, he would have sinned. But he didn't sin. He accepted it because he is indeed deity. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Here Jesus is, is confronted with a situation where the man who's paralyzed. Notice what Jesus does. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes who were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? The scribes in that day, they, these were the lawyers. These were the ones who knew what the word says. And they knew that God only could forgive sins. And here Jesus is forgiving sins. Now their hearts were hardened, so they accused him of blasphemy. But let's follow as the text continues here. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. What was the purpose of miracles? Miracles were used to confirm this, the one who is teaching. 
to confirm that what he's saying is indeed from God. Which is why Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3 came to Jesus by night and said, Teacher, we know that you come from God because nobody can do the signs, the miracles that you do unless God is with him. A great, great understanding Nicodemus had there. So when Jesus heals this man, says, Arise, take up your bed and walk. You know what that means? It verifies what he just said earlier, which was what? Your sins are forgiven. Well, who can forgive sins but God alone? And I hope as we develop this lesson and you see more and more evidence pile up, this isn't something that was just dreamed up hundreds of years after Jesus. This is a very integral part of Scripture, throughout Scripture. And these passages we're looking at, they're just the hem of the garment. I, I appreciate it. There's a wonderful, wonderful crowd here tonight. And, and as we said over dinner, there's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> so to keep this from becoming a hostage situation, I'm not going to hit all the scriptures. I'm just giving you a little taste. But as you look through scripture, you'll see these. As you're reading through your Bible, you'll see time and time again how God lays forth very clearly the deity of Jesus. We move on to John chapter 20, verse 28. Doubting Thomas, who wasn't there. You know, he missed a Sunday evening assembly. That's, that's when that happened, when Jesus showed. Thomas wasn't there. Hope you're here Sunday night. But when Thomas saw the, nails, the nail holes in his hand and put his hand in, his, in Jesus' side, he said, oh, my Lord and my God. Thomas identified Jesus so, and nobody contradicted him. Nobody said, oh, you've gone too far. No. He spoke the truth when he made that statement. John chapter 4, when Jesus is at Jacob's well and he meets that Samaritan woman and they have that conversation there at the well. As we get toward the end of the conversation, uh, chapter 4, verse 24, that passage about worshiping in spirit and truth, I'm sure Josh has preached on that one before, too, since not too long ago. If he hasn't, he soon will. The true, true worship. The woman said to him, said to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. Kind of interesting. Messiah is a Hebrew word, which means the anointed one. Christ is a Greek word, which means the anointed one. So no matter if somebody was a, a, a Jew or, or a Gentile, if they understood Aramaic and Hebrew, or if they understood Greek, no matter what language, we're going to make sure you comprende, you understand exactly what's being said here. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. I know that he is coming. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speaking to you, Am he. When you look at this in the original language, it's a, a very interesting structure to it. And if you allow me to paraphrase that in English, the one speaking to you is I am. It's a, it's a kind of a, a interesting construction in, in the original language that bringing those words together, it's redundant. Me, I am. Identifying, yes, this is the one. And what am I calling myself? I am. Well, that sounds awful similar to what we heard back in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush. When Moses asked, uh, who do I say is telling me these things? I am that I am. Same phraseology Jesus is using here. The Messiah, the Christ, 
Jesus said to her, the one speaking to you is the I am. Jesus very clearly stating that he is the Messiah. John chapter 8, verses 56 through 58, passage that uh, we referred to uh, briefly before. When Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What is Jesus claiming to be here? To pre-exist Abraham. How could he possibly do that if he was not deity, if he was not God? It would be impossible. We can talk about things that happened before we were born. But I wasn't there. I can't tell you what it was like to live through World War II. I wasn't there. What about Abraham's day? Can Jesus talk about that? Yes. Why? Because he was there. In Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, his prayer there right before he went to Gethsemane. Notice one of the things he said in chapter 17, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I, with I, which I had with you before the world was. So as Jesus is praying to his heavenly Father, he asked to be glorified with the glory that he shared with the Father before the world was, before creation. Jesus is claiming deity. And we see time and time and time and time again that Jesus is claiming deity for himself. Other people are claiming deity on Jesus' behalf. People are worshiping him. All these things are consistent with him being God. And that's exactly what we see. John begins his gospel account with the words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So as John, as John is laying forth this description of Jesus, the Word, which he comes back in verse 14, tells us the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But all these descriptions of Jesus, He was with God and He was God. By the way, he also created all things. Part of that is, is the fact that that's what God did. There was nothing that was created that Jesus didn't have an active role in creating. He's deity. Fundamental to John's gospel account. Absolutely fundamental to it. You can't go through his gospel account and not be convinced of the deity of Jesus. He begins with it, he ends with it, and he develops the thought all the way through his gospel account. Next time you read through the book of John, notice that. How he's proving that point time and time and time again. Then we get further into the New Testament. And we see like the introduction to Romans. Where Paul, in writing to the Romans, he said that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You see, the resurrection is fundamental to understanding Jesus' deity, to proving his deity. The fact that he was dead and he became alive. 
course, you find a lot of skeptics who try to discredit that. But interestingly, when we look at historical documents from that era, they're not questioning that. They try to give it a different meaning. But the fact that Jesus was crucified, he was buried, and then he rose. Fundamental, and it proves that he was deity. Who else can raise from the dead? Now we have uh, other situations in scripture where we see people being raised from the dead. Uh, Elijah did it, and, and, and Jesus himself did it, John chapter 11. But always miraculous, confirming the person who did it. In Jesus' resurrection in that case, oh, it confirms who did it. Who did it? God himself. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was raised from the dead. Declared to be the Son of God. We see the strength of that argument. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. And this is the book that uh, Josh and I have done a, a program working our way through the book of Colossians. And uh, Lord willing, before too much longer, we'll be able to finish that one up. The whole book focuses on the deity of Christ. Another great book to look through. And in chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, Jesus, he is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, just assume something with me, if you will. We'll just say for argument's sake that as I was driving down Highway 78 from Olive Branch, headed this direction, uh, I, I, I neglected to pay attention to the sign on the side of the road, and a member of Mississippi's fine law enforcement community, community I uh, decided to take exception to my rate of travel. Turned on some pretty lights and pulled me over to the side of the road. Hypothetical situation. And, and that law enforcement community member comes to the door and says, I'd like to see your license and registration, please. I don't need to give you my license. I'm James Horton. Why are you laughing? I'm James Horton. Well, how do you know I'm not? Well, we have these things today called a driver's license, and they have these, these things on them called pictures. That's how we identify people. What did they do in the first century? They didn't have Polaroids back then. They had this word that's translated image. A legal description of the person. Stands about six feet tall. Strikingly handsome. Talking about James, you can agree. Glasses. White hair. The stuff that's there is white. And, and we could go around, you know, has a, has a wonderful, wonderful spouse. Her name's Rose. She keeps him out of trouble. And we could, we could write a description of James. Say, oh yeah, that, that's him. And I wouldn't fit that description. But Jesus is the very description, the legal definition of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. Not that Jesus was created. He's going to get to that in just a second. But he is over all creation. Remember what John said. There was nothing that was made without him. For by him all things were created. That are in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, thrones or dominions, principalities and powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, the eternal nature of him, and in him all things consist. Wow, to say that, that 
the deity of Jesus was something that was made up, you'd have to toss out the book of John, you'd have to toss out the book of Colossians, and how in the world do you explain all those Old Testament prophecies dated before Jesus even came to earth? They've got a big problem, don't they? And we have wonderful, wonderful explanations of the deity of Jesus. Paul goes on to tell the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 9, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus dwells all the fullness, the completeness, everything it means to be God is in Jesus. Completely and totally. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, passage we often refer to when we're talking about elders. As Paul is there with the Ephesian elders, he tells them, take, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, descriptive term for the church, the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Notice what he's implying here. Whose blood was shed to purchase the church? Jesus. He's the one who shed the blood. It says, he purchased, God purchased the church with his own blood. Paul's implying that Jesus is God. Very clearly here, if we look to see it. Book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. John, upon seeing Jesus, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand on me and said to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. What is Jesus saying here in the book of Revelation? He's explaining to John his glorious nature. I'm the beginning and the end. I am deity. I preexisted before the foundation of the world. And where will he be throughout eternity? Same place, the first and the last. I'm he who lives, was dead risen from the dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. The firstborn from the dead. You see, everybody else who was raised from the dead eventually died again, but not Jesus. His resurrection is permanent. How can he do that? He's God. He has the keys of Hades, the grave, and of death. Who has that but God? Consider the Christ. Notice back in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20. This is back when the children of Israel were there, camped around Mount Sinai. God said, don't you dare go on that mountain. If you go up on that mountain, I will strike you dead. Allow me to paraphrase. The people said, we're not crazy. We're not going anywhere near that. Moses said to the people, verse 20, do not fear for God has come to test you so that you may, so that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. As we consider tonight's lesson, this is one of the major takeaways. When we realize who God is, who Jesus is, God in the flesh that came here for my sins, as we try to wrap our minds around his deity, we see how amazingly spectacular 
Jesus truly is. Awe, fear, respect. And what's the point? So that you may not sin. Why did Jesus have to come and be sacrificed so? Why did God, at glorious in heaven above, have to come to this earth, humble himself, suffer as he did? Why did he have to go through all of that? Because of my sin. Because of what I did. And when we know who he is and what he did, why he did it, I want to get as far away from sin as I possibly can because of who he is. When I sin, it offends him. And I don't want to be anywhere near that. Strange thing about sin. I'll be honest, there's some sins that don't tempt me in the least. There's no way I would, I, I, I'm just as far away from it. Those aren't the things that tempt me. No, the things that have some sort of appeal. Those are the things that tempt me. Maybe different from what tempts you. Everybody is tempted by something. Something shiny. Something that looks promising. Makes it tempting. How do we avoid that? When we realize just what was done to resolve our sin problem. When we begin to hate sin merely because it is sin and we build within ourselves a hatred of things that offend God. That helps us to avoid that temptation so that you may not sin. Secondly, he is worthy of our worship. Jesus is worthy of the praise that we give him. He is worthy of so much more than we're able to give him. And as a result, what am I willing to give? How am I willing to serve him? Grudgingly? Half-heartedly? Only if somebody praises me for it? Or am I motivated because of who he is? He is worthy of my very best, even if nobody ever notices. Even if it's difficult, even if it costs me something, is it worth it? Absolutely. I will give him my best. Why? Because of who he is and my relationship with him. Well, my name didn't get put in the bulletin for that. Forgive me. La ti da. Motivation's messed up. If I have a chance to serve him and my heart is where it should be, I'm going to give him 100% because of who he is. And if nobody ever notices, I'm fine with that. Oh, I, I, I'm just as bad as anybody else. I, I like to get a attaboy every once in a while. And as Christians, we should be stirring one another up to love and good works and encouraging people. But that should not be a requirement. He is worthy. I 
I don't know a lot of you here at Ripley, but I know you're a, a, a regular congregation, the Lord's people. And you're not perfect. And you know what? There's going to be times that people around you might disappoint you. They might disappoint you. May something, say something that discourages you. But you know what? He is worthy. We're imperfect people, and I'm sure I have said things and done things that not, I did not realize discouraged people. And you may have done the same thing. And people have done that to you. Is that any reason to walk away from Christ? Of course not. People are going to disappoint you. But it's not about them. It's about Him. And because of who He is, even though my little feeling might have gotten hurt, I'm not going to let that get in the way of worshiping Him. I'm going to attend the next Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. Why? Because it's for Him. I'll keep myself faithful because of Him. Not because, not give up because somebody did something that disappointed me. How crazy is that? Because Jesus is the Christ, we need to worship and do things His way. My wife, Michelle, loves it when I tell this story. <laughs> She's rolling her eyes already. You see, back a few years ago, when I was a younger man, I bought her a vacuum cleaner for Valentine's Day. <laughs> I know the rule. And if, if, you got, got, if you got, guys don't know this rule, Valentine's Day, anniversary, birth, if it has a power cord, don't do it. Don't buy it for her. But I bought her a vacuum cleaner for Valentine's Day. Why did I buy her a vacuum cleaner for Valentine's Day? Because on February the 13th, the vacuum cleaner that she loved gave up its magic smoke and it was no more. And she said, I want a vacuum cleaner just like that. Tomorrow's Valentine's Day. That's what I want. Being the sophisticated man that I am, I said, ha, ha, I'm not falling for that. No, 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 no. I'm going to get, she said, no, you'll get me that vacuum cleaner. To which I said, yes, ma'am, and gave it to her. That Valentine's Day, that's how I said, I love you. Why? Because that's exactly what she wanted. So that's what I gave her. But you see, that's how some people approach God. Oh, I'm not going to fall for that. No, no, no. I'm not going to worship that. You see, I wanna, I'm going to bring a, a big orchestra and make a big production out of it and lights and smoke and PA systems and get some rock and roll going because, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I think God's going to want. Yeah. Where's the authority? Why don't we just give him what he asked for? He's God. We're just men and women. Dust of the earth that he created. Who are we to tell him that his way isn't the right way? Who are we to change his plan of salvation? Oh, I don't want to get in the water. I think I should just say a prayer. You're going to make something up? This is God we're talking about. You can't change what he's already declared. 
Give him what he wants. Do things his way because of who he is. And consider what he did for you. He emptied himself from his glorious existence, emptied himself, came down to this earth, suffered, was rejected, despised, beaten, crucified, a horrible death that he went to willingly. Why? Because of my sin. Because he's done all of that, what am I going to do? I'm going to obey him. I'm going to live my life in a way that serves him, that pleases him, that gives him glory. If you're here tonight and you've never become a child of God, you've never obeyed the gospel plan of salvation, that's how you glorify God. That gets you started. Hearing the message, believing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of your sins, knowing that what you did forced him to that cross. Say, I don't want to do that anymore. Being willing to confess his name before men and be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. Or maybe you're here tonight as a child of God. And you look inside and you say, I haven't been living the life of a Christian. I haven't been giving God what, his, what he's due. Why don't you make it right? Won't you come while together we stand and we sing?